Morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the July 18th, 2017 operation. Sorry. All right, try again. Uh, welcome to the July 18th, 2017 Operations Committee meeting. Um, first up is a review of the Operations Committee calendar. Who, who are we talking to somebody? Are we just chatting about it? It, it, it's up to the board. I mean, the, the, if I can, for just a moment, I could explain what happened. Um, A.J. Belut alone, I'm the board executive. So uh, every year the board uh, committee uh, um, takes a look at the calendar, and at its first meeting of the new school year, July being the first, school, first meeting of the year, it approves the calendar for the year. So this year, much like last year, um, Joe Strayek, who's in the back, he worked with the Chiefs, reviewed last year's calendar, uh, reviewed all the policies, looked to make sure that we were covering certain items that are important to the board and this committee. They developed a, uh, a calendar. He and I met. Uh, there was an adjustment made, and then you and I met. The, I'm sorry, the board committee chair and I, we met. We went through the calendar. There were some changes that the board, that the committee chair, Commissioner Kashani, had asked for. I met again with uh, Joe Strake. He went back, met with the chiefs, and the adjustments were made. All of the adjustments that were requested by the committee chair were, in fact, incorporated. Um, and this is the calendar that we're presenting for the year. It is a little bit more ambitious than last year's calendar in some ways, um, but you'll see some significant changes. Uh, Commissioner Kashani had asked for things about the beginning of the school year, things like vaccination, the enrollment plan, things like that, uh, school readiness. She moved those up a little bit uh, and added some uh, some items to that so that uh, it would be a little bit more complete get coming into the school year. Um, the, other, the only other thing I wanted to say and then see if uh, Commissioner Frank and Hassan have any questions. Um, as a general rule, I thought if, if we have a presentation where something's getting started, something's being proposed and we've approved it or we've it seems like a big deal for the school system, if you're going to present it as something that's being teed up, would like to see it appear on the calendar as what happened. I mean, we've done that a number of times with transportation. The big one that I asked about was the um, uh, rezoning, uh, because that was originally brought here, and there have been a series of community meetings. Um, but the reason something like that didn't appear on here is we felt it was more appropriate for that to be to the full board. Um, so I think, Allison, just as a general rule, um, there are places on here where the agenda is not as full, so we have opportunities to add things. I, I'm not, I mean, let's just, February, for example, it's less, less full. Um, so there are opportunities where if we have some presentation, it, then it would be worth thinking about, um, and we can flag them when they come up, whether we want to follow up so we don't just kind of get left wondering what happened. And sometimes it's going to be more appropriate for it to be at the board level. So that was really the eye. Uh, and then there's some standing items, the budget calendar, transportation, sustainability, 21st century, um, school police. We, we typically have the food. That those, those have been standing items that may have changed months, but for the most part, they're still on here. So I'm sorry, do you want to schedule the things you no. want to follow on now? Or you no, just I'm just saying as they come space? up, I, I, that's, mm -hmm. that's where I, I, that was one of my, the eyes I was looking for. So I, I was looking for the follow-up to the rezoning. But when I, in conversation with AJ, that's going to be more appropriate to be on a full board meeting calendar. So as things come up as we're going through the year, we should flag some things that, um, like vaccination. It'll come up in a normal course. We'll hear about that when we get the enrollment data. But when we get a presentation to learn what the school, all that the school system is doing to address something, solve something, make something work, then we should also have the follow-up, like how did it work? Sometimes it'll be yes, sometimes it'll be the full board. But that was the lens that I brought when I reviewed it. So I don't know if you guys have any questions. No, I don't. All right, we're good then. So this does require, it is the first meeting, and by board rule, it does require the committee to approve the calendar. Um, we have just approved so the calendar. So as as I'll make a motion to approve the calendar. Oh, we have to do it like that? Okay. You, just have, you just have to say that you approve it. And oh, okay. Okay, so she moved it. Second. All three of us. Aye. Aye. Calendar's approved. Thank you. All right, good. Good. Thanks, Allison. All right. Next up, um, call center update.
Good morning. My name is Michael Radding. I'm the Director of Customer Care in the IT department, and I'm here to present the call center update. So, um, Sure. All right, so um, as we jump in, just wanted to give um, um, a quick an agenda of how we're going to move forward. Uh, so um, I'm going to share with you um, um, some background and talk about why the shift from the old call center model to the new call center model for handling incoming calls. Also share with you briefly on HEAT, which is our help desk expert automation tool, um, and it's our software that we use to track calls um, and ensure that any follow-up items um, that we connect back with folks who call in um, to ensure that their issues are resolved. And um, um, closely related with that is the upgrade of the, the application, again, the software we use to, to monitor calls. Um, and um, I'll talk briefly on some of the features of the new um, software um, that we have with HEAT. And then I'll also get into implementation and talk about the training plan, the communication strategy, just to share with the organization the change, and um, talk a little bit about um, um, going live with the new software and then the realignment of staff from the call center back to offices, which actually occurred um, on Monday of this week. All right, so just some background. Uh, call center agents throughout the district handle approximately 30,000 calls per month. And again, HEAT is the call logging software we use to um, create, monitor, and track tickets associated with requests from um, stakeholders throughout the district. And so we have with this new version of the HEAT software an opportunity to improve customer service by automating routine tasks. So there's a lot of um, tasks with the old system that were very manual and that required um, um, folks to actually go in and, and do things, but with a new system we're moving away from that um, and automating a lot of those tasks. Uh, the new system gives us real-time reporting and the ability to um, give supervisors and managers within departments um, um, additional visibility on what's going on in their offices just in terms of uh, calls being logged within the system and um, helps them to proactively address issues as they see trends just based on data. And then I think uh, another big, um, big advantage of the new software is the flexibility, availability, and scalability to more efficiently address district issues and needs. And I'll speak a little bit more about that. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, so uh, first, why the shift from the old um, model to the new model? And so the, there's been a really big push by the CEO um, for, for district office to really focus on customer service, not just district office, but schools, to really think about um, um, who our customers are, um, whether that's parents, whether that's students, whether that's other stakeholders um, for the district, and just how to deliver excellent customer service. And so closely tied to that are the, um, the four points um, up on the screen. So, um, this idea of being customer-centric and placing callers closer to the content owners. Um, first call resolution, and so um, with, with the new model, because we're pushing calls closer to departments and closer to people who have the content um, and the knowledge to address issues, um, we're looking to eliminate callbacks where someone calls and they can't get their issue resolved and the person on the phone is just telling them, you know, I'm going to take a ticket and someone's going to get back to you with resolution. And so with the new model, we're, we're going to be able to get to um, more first call resolution. And then this ownership accountability. So just with increased um, accountability, with increased um, transparency, um, there's uh, um, um, greater opportunity just to, to be more visible in our operations and greater opportunity with the new system, and we'll get into this a little later on in the presentation, to give folks more visibility into what's going on with their requests. All right. So um, briefly just talk about the old model. So the old model, we had the district main line, the 984-2000 number. Folks would call in, and they'd get routed to the consolidated call center. and. Um, call center staff would attempt to um, resolve whatever issues they had. And then if they weren't able to resolve those issues, they would create a ticket and assign it to department for further, um, for further investigation and ultimately resolution. 
And so this is the model that was in effect for FY17 in the prior year for handling um, incoming district calls. And so we moved to the new model. So um, we still have a district main line, but the difference is instead of the calls going to a consolidated call center, as you can see from the diagram, calls are being routed directly to offices. So someone calling in the main line wants IT, um, their call is going to go directly to IT staff in the IT office. And, and same thing applies for academics, finance, and the other offices listed in there. Um, in addition to that, there's um, a couple of other avenues that folks can uh, connect with us um, for um, just to have questions answered or um, issues resolved. And so there's um, um, folks have the ability to email directly. So there's a dedicated um, district office um, email account and folks can email that account. And where before I talked briefly about how we're moving from manual processes. So in the old, uh, old way of doing things, we had someone man that um, mailbox just to check to every day to see if there were um, new emails that came in. And then based on that, they manually go into the system and create tickets. But with the new system, it automates that process. And so it goes from a request coming in and through email to automatically generating a ticket. Another big feature um, of the new system is self-service. And so this gives employees within the system an ability to see where their request is in the process. And so um, to, to give you an example, for instance, um, someone, a teacher gets a new certification and they reach out to the 8C office just to let them know what their new certification is and to make sure that it's added to, to their employee record. Um, with the old system, um, oftentimes you'd have folks calling in just to ask and check on the status of, of, of where things were, just in terms of making sure that was applied to their record. With the new system, it gives folks the ability to, to do self-service, meaning they can um, actually go into the system and create a ticket on their own without having to call someone. And whenever they log into the system, they could, they could check on the status of, of that ticket. And any time the status changed, so if the 8C staff upload the um, certification information into the employee record, they would automatically receive a notification about the, the change of um, that ticket from being open to being closed and the resolution that was applied in their case. Um, so self-service is going to eliminate a lot of callbacks just from employees who, you know, come in and, and need some kind of service and just want to know the status of that request. And then, of course, um, the fourth one is um, we're, we're going to be uh, putting on the district website departmental phone lines so the public and just um, other external stakeholders can quickly reach the office they need to reach. So with the prime model, um, everything got routed to the consolidated call center. And ultimately, all these things are, are in place to move customers closer to the content offices um, and basically move towards improved customer service. So just briefly touching on the actual heat application. So we moved from an on-site uh, model, on-site um, call, call logging application to a hosted service model. Uh, we went live with a new system on July 5th. Um, and so the heat service management is a cloud-based solution that gives users access from anywhere um, at any time from any device. And so the advantage of that is, you know, from a, um, a cell phone or a tablet, it's very easy to go into the system and check on the status of a request or even to put in a request. So it's not dependent on any device or dependent on um, folks being able to be connected to the district's network. So just briefly, I'll just touch on some of the features of the new call logging system. So I, I touched on self-service functionality where staff can submit and track requests on their own without having to call into an office. Um, I talked briefly on the prior slide about that it's a cloud-based solution, which means that um, 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 folks can access it anywhere at any time on any device. There's a, a mobile app functionality which um, extends access to, um, as I mentioned before, tablets and smartphones. Um, the system comes with a knowledge base that we, um, we are actually building on right now and FAQs which are accessible to all users. And one of the advantages of this is from the perspective of folks who are answering and fielding calls in the district office, they will have the ability to, um, as they're listening to a caller and just typing in some of the information, um, the system will automatically queue up based on prior responses and prior resolutions um, 
ways to address whatever issue they have. And what that does is it helps, um, um, it helps us handle calls much quicker um, just because people will have, people fielding calls will have access to this information right from the screens as they're typing in. And it also gives us the ability to onboard, pe um, onboard people much quicker. So one of the challenges is just with bringing someone into the organization and trying to teach them all our internal practices, that takes a long time. And with this new system, that just helps us to get people, bring people up to speed much quicker on our systems and our practices. Um, and then um, the syst new system gives, it integrates our HC system and our student information system, which enables single sign-on. So you don't have to remember another network username and another password. You just use the same username and password you used to sign into the network. Just that alone. <laughs> just that alone. I mean, having people not have to remember all these different, I'm sorry, that's just a personal thing. I just had to say it. No, it's huge. <laughs> the yeah. older you get, the worse it is. <laughs> right, right. Right, and and that was a and that was a complaint that we heard from the old system, just because there's so many systems that people have to remember that type of information, and then um, enhanced reporting that includes real-time dashboards on key metrics on the quality of customer service. So again, just bringing additional visibility to what's going on, and um, giving folks, um, supervisors and managers in offices, just um, additional layer of, of of information and reports. Um, that will help them be more proactive in addressing issues coming in. All right, so just briefly going to touch on the training plan. So we, um, we've offered training in, in different ways. Um, we made an online course that's been available for staff since uh, June 16th. Um, we made that available through CSI. One of the things we want to do is just because of the timing for when that was launched is we're going to um, um, basically put out additional notices on that and time it for teachers returning. So when teachers return in August, we're just going to publicize that again um, to make sure they see it and they have a chance to, um, to take the online training, which includes, um, for instance, how to submit, how to do the self-service piece. So staff have the ability to go into the system and um, create their own requests and then track those requests from creation up, up until the point they're resolved. Um, training for school leaders is actually going on right now during the um, chief academic office is hosting a summer leadership um, series in July, August, August, and so we're targeting school-based staff, including um, administrative, 12-month administrative staff like um, school secretaries. And um, district office, <coughs> excuse me, we've been training district office for the last four weeks. And so at this point, we have over 100 people trained in this building um, with additional uh, trainings being offered um, um, this month and going into August. And, um, and there's additional training opportunities um, going all the way into September, and we're going to continue to make sure that those are available to staff. And so one of the things we want to do is create um, a long ramp so that, um, so just knowing that um, throughout the course of the year, there's going to be people coming into the district or people who just need refresher courses, and so we'll make those available to staff as well. Commissioner Frank has a question. Just a question about training. Does the training focus on the specifics of actually how you use the system, how you create tickets and things like that, or are you also training the value of customer service? How do you uh, sort of, how do you present yourself to the public? How do you become, we're never going to become Nordstrom's or Southwest Airlines, but how, how are you conveying to employees that this is important, you're the face of the district, not just here's how you use the system, but here's how you provide quality customer service? So the training is mostly focused on the new system. We do touch on customer service a bit, but parallel to, to this training initiative is, is I talked in the beginning about how the, the CEO has, um, um, has, has indicated that customer service is one of her big drives for this year. And so and in parallel to this training, there's a, a train, another training effort that's specific to customer service and what that looks like for staff. And so that's actually being rolled out now in July and August. And, um, one of the things we are doing is targeting anyone who is, is um, customer facing the organization to make sure those folks get that training as well. And so we're starting off with, um, at a high level, just talking about what customer service means, but we are also looking into doing a deeper dive and just addressing things like, you know, how do you address um, conflict and how do you deal with someone who, um, um, how do you just deal with those difficult types of situations that could come up just in, in, in everyday interaction? 
kind of developed a plan of where we're training or we're working on a plan of where we're training. So again, as Michael said, kind of the real um, public facing offices like um, people answering the phones, like enrollment choice and transfer. Um, at some point we want to get out to schools and talk to office secretaries. So that's part of, so this is more specific to heat, but um, uh, but there will be, there is a specific uh, plan and that Michael's leading on um, customer service. I, mean, I, I, I think it's terrific and I appreciate you not um, sort of taking the easy way out and, and making excuses that we're, you know, in a bare bones staff at Central and we can only provide so much customer service. I appreciate that, but let me ask the question. Given the fact that we have one of the smallest central districts in the country and you're raising the expectation about customer service, how do you reconcile those two? I mean, I think, I mean, I, that is the legitimate challenge. And um, part of the problem I think that people face um, is that, you know, it is, um, it can be, it can take a longer to get answers sometimes out of central office because, um, because we're just really short staff. So um, I think, you know, it's about things like making sure at least people hear back that you know that they've contacted you and that you're working on it and you'll get back to them. Um, and then it's also, as Michael said, I think a lot of it is because there can be that frustration and there just is frustration dealing with any um, large organization, is that also that you, that there's good, that you start off with good customer service uh, with respectful interactions with folks. Um, I think anybody who deals, and I, it's not just um, large government entities, it's just large entities. I mean, I know I'm often in my own personal life dealing with private sector entities that are not too friendly. So, I mean, I know we often talk about it as if it's a government thing. It's not just a government thing. And you can get really frustrated with the person you're interfacing with when it's really not their fault. It's the company's policy or whatever it is. So how do you kind of, you know, engage with people in a respectful way in the beginning to kind of make it less likely they're going to get upset? And then if it gets to, get, does get to the point where people are getting frustrated with the, what the responses they're getting or, or, um, or maybe lack of response that there's de-escalation training as well because that's just going to be, that is a real part of the work. I mean, these are difficult decisions that people are calling to get information about and so they're not always going to like the response. So we want to make sure that we start off friendly and respectful and that we also have a way that we're going to de-escalate and not escalate um, 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 interactions. And then, uh, so just shifting to the communication strategy, uh, we're looking at a, very, um, a number of different uh, communication platforms to ensure that um, all our stakeholders are aware and knowledgeable about the changes that are, 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 have happened um, and that will continue to happen with the shift to the new model. And so we've been using the, the newsletter, we're relying on um, emails to, to key folks who've been identified um, within offices, you know, to, to handle calls and to also close out heat tickets. Um, we're using and leveraging our Blackboard notification system, which um, our teachers use um, pretty extensively. And um, um, I think I talked about this before, but um, we're also leveraging the, the professional development um, opportunities that are already scheduled. So starting off with the CAO Institute for School-Based Staff, but extending on to um, once, um, once, um, once the school year starts, just other already scheduled PD opportunities just to make sure that we, we connect and, and um, reach out to those school-based staff as well as a district office. I was just curious, um, are you also uh, using, taking advantage of our partners in their networks? So PCAB, uh, Baltimore Education Coalition, um, Urban, uh, Helen, Helen Atkinson. Teachers. Teachers Democracy Project. I'm just thinking about people that have the ability to reach their people um, because this new system is in response to a system that wasn't particularly friendly. So if now we're innovating and putting something in place that is trying to be more transparent, give people access, um, I would think you'd want to use every channel available and those are willing partners that would, I, I'm sure would love to there's all kinds of coalitions, the climate coalition, and in the, in the, in the, uh, in the engagement office knows who those people are. But I just think it would be an, another channel to use. Okay. We can definitely do that and reach out yeah, to Yeah, I mean, it'd be hard for you to do it by yourself. You'd need a, a list, but somebody has, I mean, Sabrina has that, Sabrina has okay. that list. We can reach out to the engagement office just to make sure that we do that. Okay. Uh -huh. um, Commissioner Hassan has a question and then Commissioner Frank. And I'm, I'm sure you have a plan for it, but since it didn't come up and there may be people listening, uh, what about TTY or second language translation contacts? Do if people need, you know, someone to answer their question in Spanish, do they go to a separate Spanish line or do they contact academics and it's handled through there? 
So we actually have, um, and this is something that we've had for many years, we have a, um, a translation service. And so the, when you go into the call tree and you select the Spanish option, for instance, there's a Spanish option right at the start of the call tree, that connects, um, connects puts us through to a third party that does translation services, multiple languages. And so what ends up happening is a, a, a three-way conference call with this third party that does the translation piece. And so just so we can ensure that we can communicate with whoever's calling in. So that's part of our regular service. And just, just sharing that in this, in this kind of presentation whenever you push out so that okay. those parents and families know okay. they don't have to jump through extra hoops. Thank okay. you. Just one other question for Allison. In, in terms of this being a, a priori priority of the CEO, does this become part of an evaluation for central staff and for principals, the customer, uh, customer service? service. So um, and we haven't figured out exactly how to make that part of the evaluation, but I think that um, that is a high priority. So trying to figure out how to make sure we're evaluating that makes sense. We, I, don't, we, I don't have a concrete way we're going to do that yet, mm -hmm. but it does make sense because it is a high priority. And for things like this door knocking campaign we're doing right now with um, with neighborhoods, I just went to Hampton last night with some of our door knockers. And um, you know, to the extent that you're generating uh, interest in schools and people are showing up at schools, we want to make sure that um, that they're getting a friendly reception when they re go to that school. So, um, so it's something for principals to be held accountable. It's something for us centrally to be held accountable. So we need to figure out how to do that. Well, it sounds like there's some data that could be useful if you're going to be able to look in each office and see. I was, I'd assume, volume of calls, response time, resolution, follow-up complaints. I mean, that doesn't mean it's going to be easy to translate it into evaluation, but it sounds like, unless I'm misunderstanding, that there will be plenty of data that's generated automatically from this system. And there will be. Is that correct? That's could correct. It, could it do the, if you're interested, please stay on the line for a one-question survey after your call? It's actually... Something as simple as that, and then the question being, how likely would you be to hire the person you just spoke to mm -hmm. in a customer service role? It's actually every um, call that, that comes in, um, the... Once the, once the ticket gets resolved and closed in the system, the person who initiated gets an email just saying it was closed, but there's a link at the bottom of every response that includes a link to survey. So we do have um, a lot of you know, customer service um, satisfaction type data that we will have. Would it be possible to set it up more like a calendar invite where they simply, they don't have to click to a secondary link to mm -hmm. fill out a survey, but just click, you know, how satisfied were you? One, two, three, four, five, click it, and it automatically sends? We can look into that. You, you said IT are pretty smart. <laughs> <laughs> we can Thank definitely you. look into that. All right. So that that was all. There's additional information in the appendixes, just in terms of timeline, um, some of the um, stakeholder engagement that we we did in um, launching this new system. But um, um, but that's it. Uh huh. Thanks a lot. Right. Very helpful. Keeping with our technology theme, the 21st century digital network, not to be confused with the 21st century con school construction, although I'm sure they're related. I want to say every time these IT people show up, they're saving us money and time. Mm -hmm. Literally. Turn your mic on. Thank you. All right. Sorry. My name is Elvis Tia, Director of Infrastructure and Data Center Securities. Um, the 21st century network design is what our objective is. Currently, there are schools being constructed for to meet the 21st century requirement, and we have to make sure that our infrastructure also meets that requirement. Um, the there are schools right now that are going through construction. However, the school system itself has to do its best. Now, we have we've looked at what is required to make sure that we meet the requirements to support the academic, you know, objectives. We've looked at equity, access, security, availability, and resilience. 
From our perspective, there are four major things that we can use to make that happen, which are VoIP, switches, wireless, and bandwidth. When I say bandwidth, I'm talking about internet access throughout our district as well as our schools. So the, excuse me, the first thing I'm going to talk about is the wireless environment. So right now we have very few wireless access points in our district. With this new implementation, we will have one access point in every classroom, which means that um, the, the expectation is for every 40 students, there will be a wireless access point to deliver wireless access to those students. It's very costly. Right now we have about um, 1,500 access points throughout the district. But our objective is to have 5,000 access points throughout the district. As I speak to you right now, the installation of those access points are going on in our schools. Um, it is very costly. Um, we are being subsidized by USAC, which is going to pay about 5.9 million for this, and then that, which is 85% of what is required. Now, on the balance, 15% is going to be this, the district's responsibility. And that will be paid by our, we've already talked to the finance office, and that will come from our capital improvement. So the schools is not going to pay anything. We're just going to go, go, go ahead and upgrade the schools. Um, so we've started this process a couple years back, but we've never done a lot. We had only 32 schools. Now our objective is to make sure all of our schools have the wireless access that is required for all students. Because the one-to-one -one ratio, you know, we got Chromebooks coming into our district. Every student will have a device. And if we don't improve our wireless infrastructure, then they're going to have a bottleneck. The internet is going to be slow. Additionally, we have most of our things in the cloud right now. So we have to make sure they have the kind of access they need so that, you know, when academic or for every instruction of, uh, every instruction that goes on, they're not going to have any bottleneck because we've experienced in the past that schools will have problems with slowness and stuff like that. So we're working on making sure everything is up to date. Just a quick question. So you said it's being covered by CIP. So this has already been in a CIP budget that's been approved? Um, so we've talked to finance about um, the 15% that is left by USAC. Because USAC pays 85. So it's 15% left for yeah. the district to pay. But our CIP is really carefully monitor with the state. There's all these different projects. Some get approved, some don't get approved, some stay in the pipeline. So are, are we saying that we have available to us to spend on this? Because it sounds like something that we should definitely do, a, you know, wireless connection for each classroom. So we're saying that we have available to us now the $895,572.45 to do this. Mr. T is going to talk to you, is talking to you about three initiatives. Yeah. Uh, this, for the first wave, these 12 schools, uh, Commissioner, it's being paid from, from, from our, the savings from our voice communication, uh, cell phone bill, uh, mobile uh, telephone bill. The, the finance department is going to be, they have found the funds, and it's coming to the board with the uh, August or September board for the remaining schools. We have not received the funding commitment for the remainder, but for the first three, 12 schools are being paid for out of savings from our voice communications bill. The first which schools? 12. We, 12. We, 12 schools. Okay, all right. Maybe I'm, I'm sorry if I misunderstood that. That's okay. And just to clarify, those 12 schools have some wireless service, or at this point they have no? All, no, all schools, all schools within the district has a wireless presence. Okay. Our goal with this initiative is to put full building-wide access, uh, wireless access at all of our schools. But I, I don't think this is on in our capital improvement. That's I think you were talking about it, we're using, like it's a capital investment. I don't it's think a capital you, investment. I don't think you yeah. literally oh, meant the capital improvement project, right? No, ma'am. No, okay, you're actually right. That, yeah. oh, thank I'm you. Sorry. I, think, that, I think it's just coming out of our uh, general funds. And, yes, uh, I'm yes. sorry. Okay, yes. because I was like, wow, that, that yeah. it, the yeah. thought that the state would have approved a school by school by school wireless connection, which would be awesome, but yeah. doesn't I just think you, and, and you I'm just sorry. meant that it's thank just you, a capital Alex. investment. It's not it is specifically coming out of that pot of money. So then that, that concept also applies to the, wire, to the switches. So capital investment is going to cover for the switches in the schools. Uh, one thing we've noticed is uh, if you look on the screen, the switch that is below, which is purple, is the extreme switch. 
Um, we're going to upgrade to our Cisco environment. Those are the switches that have the intelligence that is required for us to deliver the kind of speed, security, and priority for, for the students to have the access they need. Again, so this is also costly. USAC covers what USAC is a 9.8, and then our capital investment is going to take care of the 1.7. So this is also transparent to the school. So we're not asking the schools to pay anything. We just want to upgrade the infrastructure in the back end so we, that we don't have the problems we used to have before. So same question. We, so obviously this stuff definitely brings us into the 21st century. I mean, whenever you're in school and you're trying to do something, it's slow as molasses. So yes, it, this is great. But the, we have the, the finance department has told you we have the 1.74, et cetera, et cetera, million dollars? Yes, and, and actually, and Commissioner, the, the, in, the, in, the, the, in the general fund budget, capital, the capital budget, uh, these numbers. No, general fund budget. General, general fund, fund budget. Yeah. The numbers, and the, these are high because, and we, we applied for this two years ago. Uh, and we got board approval, and we got pre and, and we got USAC approval. The 1.7 is high end because the way they fund us is they take the student population and the building size. So actually, the numbers are going to be. We, these were the initial wave numbers. It's roughly going to come in around 1.2, 1 million. Okay. So yes, we have the funds in general fund to cover this, and the numbers are going to be ex much lower than what was being reflected. And can you remind me because we have we, we really haven't talked about this in a while. I remember we had a conversation, mm -hmm. detailed conversation about a couple of years ago. Can you remind us of what USAC stands for? Uh, United Service uh, Fund. It's the federal E-rate program. E-rate. E-rate. That's what it is. If you look at your telephone bill on every telephone bill, I think it went up to two dollars and fifty cent. Now, the, on every telephone bill across the country, there's two dollars and fifty cent there, and it covers schools and libraries. Uh, for multiple categories, not just wireless, not just switches, not just internet access, uh, but WANs. It, it covers many categories. These are the funds, and based on your free and reduced lunch within the district, that determines your uh, your uh, reimbursement model. So within Baltimore City, we're on a 15 cent per dollar, so we're 85 percent reimbursement. Okay. I'm sorry, I was distracted with actually a computer issue, but. The um, so so in in layman's terms, where will Baltimore City be as a district relative to districts that you think are doing it right, whether it's in Maryland or elsewhere? I don't. I can only understand this in terms of relative to other districts or where you want us to be. So can you kind of explain at the end of the day when we get the funding from the general funds and from E-rate and these investments, how our schools will fare? If you look at Baltimore City, and strangely enough, we were with our, with our colleagues last week at the Council of Great, School, Great City Schools, and we got to compare uh, where we are as a district compared to other districts around the world, around the nation. Uh, if you look at our bandwidth now, if you look at our WAN now, as you look as a district, we have a gig capacity to every school. We had 10, 15 gig out to the internet. So compared to our sister, our brother, LEAs across the country, we are in a very good place. These initiatives that we are doing now moves us to that next level. But the very good place, would the principals and teachers in those schools agree with that? As far as access, access as far as device-wise, no. And that's, that's another, but as far as the actual, uh, once you get on the network, I believe they would, as far as the, uh, the reliability and So efficiency. where we are today, we're in a very good place. As far as access, yeah. yes, sir. And, and, uh, and strangely, last year at the uh, legislative, we were called, uh, Baltimore City was called to testify uh, because of the park testing. And, and we, were, we got uh, accolades uh, because of our, the way we, our, our testing went, the way the, the resiliency of the network, uh, the way it held up, and, and the way our students progressed. So uh, are we there? No, no by, not by any chance. But uh, we are in a good place. So, so with the proposal here, where would that take us? This will take us to what, a place. What will, what will the difference be in the schools? What will the experience be with teachers and principals and students in the schools that they don't have now with these investments? As, as, as today, as we walk to schools, in many of our schools, there are certain parts of the building that they can use their devices, their mobile devices. Mm -hmm. Once we finish this, they can go to any part, any location within their building, whether it be the media center, whether it be the uh, fifth grade classroom, whether it be the third wing, upper wing. We're putting building-wide wireless access coverage. So regardless of where you are in that building, mm -hmm. uh, they'll be there. The switches play a different role. Now, the switches we have, they're in the life as of last month. So they, they're performing where we want to. But, but this will give us the, uh, in other words, if, if they were to, the connectivity die, 
that we could just hot swap them out. So it maintains the continuity, the resiliency within the building. So regardless of where you are in that building, regardless of what the instructional material or the business need within that building, being able to go anywhere within that building to get connectivity to do what your instructional business needs of the day. And last question, I'm gonna, sorry if you covered this. So this is something, is it funded? This is, and, and if so, over what period of time will it be implemented? We, uh, again, uh, back in, we applied two years ago. We did, did the solicitation, required board, board approval, but uh, uh, you can't really put a, a calendar on E-Ray. We just got our funding approval last March. Mm -hmm. So based on that, it's a, to answer your question, there's a two-year implementation, but based on the late approval that we got our funding for our first 12 schools, they have given us a year extension. So based on that, uh, we see this probably bleeding into uh, the 18-19 school year to have this completed before the money run out. For the 12? No, 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 for all oh, schools. For all schools. For all okay. schools. All right. Follow-up question? Uh, wait, can I just do one follow-up on that? So in terms of the existing state, there are, as Ken said, there are, some, there are a number of places in some of our schools where it is hard to access, the, um, to access wireless. And so that is, I mean, we've heard that from some schools. So this will be you know, this will make a difference to those schools where anywhere in the building you can go and you can get access. The other thing I was hoping you could talk about, uh, Ken, a little bit is that this will mean that more students have access to wireless. So what are you doing to make sure that that, that there's not a bottleneck issue where it's slow, uh, where the service then is slow with all those people um, having, all the students having access? And thank you. And, and, and uh, the, the, the current model, the cur even in this building, uh, we, the, the old model of the access point probably bottled out at 15, 25 users at, at any given time. But with the, uh, with the wireless connectivity that we're placing in our buildings now, it is a bleed over or a right brain, left brain. So if I get 100 people in this room, regardless of what location you are, it automatically pushes those, those users over to other devices within the building, thus the building-wide connectivity. Also, and, and I don't know if the board is aware, we and uh, 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 Chief uh, Cohen, uh, approved us, uh, at least we just signed off on yesterday. We're, we have been approved for another grant which provides 25,000 free devices which are going to be a part of uh, this, this uh, of the instructional program for the FY17-18 school year. So this model allows those students to bring those devices in the school to be on our network to have the access they need to also integrate that into the instructional environment. But I was referring to the firewall. So we have a firewall that all the uh, that mm -hmm. schools have to go through right. in order to you know protect the information that's um, being accessed in our schools, and that has to go through us. And so, what are you doing to ensure that with more people accessing our internet that the firewall is not um, is not slowing um, the slowing the you know, Ab search. absolutely and that was another upgrade that we having to do this summer uh, even though we have gig connectivity to all of our schools even though we have 10 gig out to the internet I have to safeguard the data or the content which our students and staff view so as Ms. Uh, Chief Cohen was addressing the filtering capacity at, at the time it, as of less uh, last month was one gig so even though we, I could I could I could funnel out 10 gig. My filtering could only handle up to one, two gig. On a good day, I have digital and and and, uh, and DHS uh, uh, in North Avenue. So what we did was we have upgraded, have the devices in place now. So not only will we be 10 gig out to the internet, but we also will have the capacity to 10 gig filter at the same time. So it is true throughput. So I got a four lane highway at the time. I only had one lane capacity. So we opened that four lane up to actually four lanes for both filtering, content, monitoring, and browsing. Thank you. Uh, so another question, when we, we say all schools, and we're about to face closing schools, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the kids in the process, though, need, this, need technology, you know, say their school's closing in two years, they still need that two years of learning access. Mm -hmm. But we also have to be fiscally responsible with putting money into schools we're closing. How is that conversation going? That is a what? very close conversation with our facilities department, and we use this as a guide, to your point, the two years. And the good thing about switches and the ac access points, the only true piece that's truly married to that building is the cabling. So e these are E-rate funding, I, I mean E-rate purchase equipment. I have to track these devices probably for the next seven, ten years. I have to account for them. So even though that building is closing in two years, I can easily go in. You're moving from North Avenue to uh, Lakeland, uh, Cape, whatever the case may be. I can remove these devices, take them out, transition them to that new facility. So it is not 
you know, it is, it's not violation of any USAC or E-rate policies. I'm installing it. It stays with the student. It stays with the building. I can, as long as I can account for the, these devices, it is a true investment in their child. So as long as I can track it, account it, in which we do. There's press special labeling. There's a special inventory for these pieces. So uh, it is very much a part of our process. And to your point, not to delay or to hinder that learning experience for that child to ensure that we put the resources and devices in place right now. Again, we have wireless in every building, but this is just spreading the net, expanding the capacity, expanding the access, expanding the equity in all of our buildings. Thank you. Okay, so just, just to add to that, b before we decided to put wireless in all of the schools, we had this uh, Race to the Top project where the, the, the teacher would take a, a mobile card that has all of the laptops in the card from one classroom to another classroom, and that teacher has to take the laptop off the card and you know, set it up for each student. That takes away class time from the students because they didn't have wireless in every classroom, so you pull this card from class. First grade, you move to the second grade, you got to pull the card. But with the wireless being everywhere, now it gives them back a lot of time because they don't have to pull the card anymore. They just have to turn the laptop on or the Chromebook or whatever they have and just use it. So that's going to make a lot of difference. And then to add to the switch piece, so the switches that we're getting rid of, the at end of life, as Dr. Thompson said, and each of those switches is about $10,000 a piece. So if we don't replace these switches with the opportunity we have now, every time a switch goes down, it's going to cost us about $10,000 to buy a new one. So we have to do that as soon as we can. And then the voice environment as well. So, <clears throat> so we are replacing our schools, the analog phones in the, in the schools with digital lines because we realize that analog is very costly and then there's a lot of problem for the teachers as well because if the IEP office is not on the second floor this year, is on, or the principal decides to move the IEP office to the third floor, right? So. We're going to have to call Verizon. That requires including a third party. Verizon comes in to tell you you give them two weeks before they show up to move the line to the next place. But for voice of IP, the teacher can just pick up the phone, like in this building, go to the next office, plug the phone in, and continue to work as it is. Now, that's the benefit from the instructional side, the building, right? They can move easily from one point to another. Um, additionally, if we have transform our schools moving from one location to the other, it's easier for them to just collect the phones, go to the next location, plug the phones in, and they're fine. Right now, if a school is to move from one building to the other, it's a lot of problems because you're going to have to call Verizon. It will take three weeks to send a tech out, and then the tech is going to have to manually move the analog lines from one school to the other school. And sometimes school opens, and then the main office line is not active yet because we're waiting on Verizon. We don't have control over that. With the voice environment, all we have to do is pick up the phone, go to the next location, plug it in, and that's it. We control everything from back here. So if phones go down, we know that. With Verizon, if there's a problem at the school with the phone, the school has to call us to say, hey, my phone is not working. So that makes us, we cannot be proactive. We're always reactive. We want to be proactive. We want to know if a phone goes down at the school. We want to have somebody there before they call us to let us know. And then additionally, um, Cost-wise, right, so we pay about two, $220,000 a month for analog lines. With the voice of IP, it's, it's going to be far cheaper than that. We've already started to roll out our phones. We started last year. We rolled out the first 300 phones with authorization from Dr. Thompson. So right now, we're not paying the 220. We're paying about 100, I think, 135000 a month now. And we're still in the process of rolling out more phones to the school, and it's going to cost us to save more money. Yeah, that's a, a comment actually for Allison. You know, this the savings of 1.8 million a year has certain energy ESCO like qualities where the district will be saving money over a period of 20 years or so. You know, I'm just thinking creatively about accessing capital dollars or investment dollars, and it's possible to potentially borrow against that savings, like you might with energy savings, make the investments in technology in the schools, which frees up general funds for other purposes. So it's, I mean, it is, instead of getting the savings on an annual basis, you're monetizing it, and there's probably ways to do that either through the city or through the district itself. I'm sure John would have ideas of how to do that. But okay. it's, it's, yeah, that's it's, I think idea. I think you'd find lenders out there that might be willing to, to lend against the savings that you're getting here. Especially since this uh, this savings is a, a well-documented, it's, it's not a new right. technology, it's new for us, but it's it, you can bank on it. 
Yeah. Long term, absolutely. Yeah. And, and I must say, and, and if I can add, uh, commissioners, as of today, uh, because of the work of Mr. Tia, that 2.6 million has dropped, our, our, and he was telling you about the increase. We have dropped to 1.6 million in savings as of today. Uh, and, and based on the schools that we're rolling out this month and next month, I truly believe that that 1.8 is truly going to actually going to be uh, more around the 2.1, 2.2. Uh, and the second piece that Mr. Tia didn't share, this was also funded through E-rate, and this is a service that the federal government is cutting out. So these are long, these are reimbursement that we're not going to receive, and these are long-term savings that we're going to be able to actualize over the long term. So no more long distance, no more three-way calling, but long-term savings that the district are true savings for the district in the long term. The one thing I don't understand, well, there's a lot about this I don't understand, but the, the one I can highlight on here is that it says the voice over internet protocol schools 55. Are we are we attempting to address all schools? Or That's only how many 55? schools that we have today. today. This will be all yeah. schools. We today we have 55 voiceover schools that are totally voiceover IP that have these phones in place. Our goal when we finish this initiative, all schools. And so this 2.6, which may be lower, um, the June 2006, excuse me, July 2016 to June 2018, that's for all schools. That's all so schools. So the 55 yes, is just a point in time. Yes, ma'am. Okay. That was at the time of the present. Yes, doing creation. Just one follow-up thought. So, um, uh, Andy, that's a really good idea, and we'll talk to finance. My only concern is that um, to the degree to which we've already been assuming those savings right. to offset these other investments that you're seeing. So, and I think that we have been. So that's the challenge. So we already basically are using it to invest in other things, I believe. But I'll check. Okay. So, Dr. Th Dr. Thompson talked about the the internet. So, actually, we we not 10 gigs. We 20 gigs aggregated because our schools traffic from a school can go out through the digital. We have a data center at Digital Harbor High School, and we have a data center here at HQ, right? So, some schools go out through Digital Harbor High. Some schools go out through HQ. So, and it's active, active. So, it's aggregated 20 gigs of speed. Um, with our res research, we found out that the highest utilization from our school right now is 60% uh, utilization of the 100%. Now, some schools will complain about slowness, and that is because the, either the wireless infrastructure was older, the switches were older, or at the time we had, we did have five gigs, five gigs aggregated at both data centers. Now, we're gonna move it to 10 gigs. And the reason why we have to do that is because we have a lot of things in the cloud as opposed to year, last year or year before where we have a lot of things in our data centers. We have email in the cloud. We have infinite campus in the cloud. We have Blackboard in the cloud. We have data link in the cloud. So these kind of traffic, they don't just end up in our data centers. They have to go out into the cloud. So we're going to have to increase our pipe. So um, crazy. our internet pipe is now 10 gig. We've also secured the appliances, thanks to Dr. Thompson, that uh, we're going to, in, those appliances will be installed in the next two weeks, getting prepared for the school year, so that once teachers get back, Speed shouldn't be an issue. We shouldn't have conversation about slowness as we put these things into the school. That shouldn't be a problem. Great. So just a quick summary of the impact of these things. Students and staff will have, will have access to any mobile devices from the wireless perspective. Uh, so with our new infrastructure, we will be able to accommodate more than 150,000 simultaneous connection, bandwidth wise. Um, and then this will support the one-to-one -one initiative too. We, we've tested that in two of our schools, the one-to-one -one initiative, that was Dallas Nichols, Dallas Nichols and Edgewood, just to see how it's gonna play off. And it, it did go well. So we wanna have the infrastructure in place so that when the student get the devices, then we already have the infrastructure in place. We don't have to go and change anything. So, and, and, and for the wireless to work, the switches in the back end have to accommodate the wireless traffic. That's why, in addition to our switches going end of life, we have to replace the switches with intelligent switches that can determine whether the traffic is from a student or whether the traffic is from a teacher. Because that's another thing, security. So right now, as I speak to you, if you go into any of our schools, if you take your personal device and plug it into the wall to get access to the internet, that traffic comes back to us. Our devices are intelligent to decide whether this is a teacher or this is a student or if this is a guest. Depending on who you are, we put you in a separate pocket for security. That's the reason why when we got hit with this whole, when the ransomware thing came out, 
we knew it was there, but we had our security in place. And then our firewall was also on standby. No traffic comes from the school and go directly to the internet. Everything comes here to us before it goes to the internet. Well, the schools might think they go directly to the internet, but that's not the case. Every traffic that comes from the school, it comes to us first. We inspect that. Speaking of uh, chief of staff, when she was talking about firewall security, all traffic comes here first. We see it before it goes to the internet. Um, and then the voice of IP piece, we also talk about that, right? So from the VoIP perspective, we save money and then it's also it's ease of manageability for the teachers and we also have the ability now to see if something is wrong. Like if the wireless, if the infrastructure we have right now, if one access point has more than 40 users, 40 users connected to it, we get an email from, that, from the system saying this access point is overloaded. So we, that's how far our intelligence has gone in terms of dealing with these appliances. And that's the same thing we're going to use when we shall have completed the VoIP deployment. If one phone goes down, we're going to know. Another piece we're working on, we've been testing is the voicemail to email. We're working on that now for our executives in the building so that if you call somebody's phone and you leave a voicemail, that voicemail automatically gets sent to you as an email because our executive, people might be traveling, driving, right, doing something else, and they're not in the office. So they don't have to come back to work to check the voicemail. They just get it as an email. Now, with the analog system, that would never work. So these are some of the things we're putting in place. Bandwidth-wise, we have a 20 gig aggregator for all of our schools right now, so that shouldn't be a, an issue. So I'm, but when we get done putting all of these things in place, we will be at a very good place. I mean, we're not going to be the best in the world, but we're going to be great. Second in the nation. Who's <laughs> <Sorry>. first? <laughs> Who's first? And what do we I, I always leave room at the top for somebody to excel me, but we, we go for the top. Yes, we'll be second getting ready to be first. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. And that's it. We have some information in the appendices, but... I think this is what we have. Yeah, to this is terrific. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, vaccination. The reason I asked if we could talk about this is connected to um, our ongoing, when I say our, I mean the board, uh, our ongoing obsession with uh, enrollment, all things enrollment. And this is one of those categories that um, feels preventable because it's a, we get the kids, we get them vaccinated, they can be in our classrooms. And had had several conversations with the principal at Ben Franklin um, High School last year um, when I went there on, on the opening day of school. That was the school that I went to. And, you know, he just had ideas um, about how they use vans at their school to get kids to places. They have an, an innovative way that they're going, and so he had other ideas, and I just wondered how much... I figured we were doing a lot, but I wanted to know sort of how extensive are our efforts and are we getting all the co possible cooperation we could need from the health department to make this work? So that's why I requested the presentation, so I appreciate that you were willing to tee it up. Microphone? And introduce yourself, please. For the record. We're good? Okay. Sorry. I know my voice doesn't carry, but I, I just didn't look. Uh, good morning, and my name is Louise Fink, and I have been working with vaccinations for many years. Um, we did reach 99.95 .95 compliance last year, uh, which is right up there with most of the other districts in the system. We're kind of uh, in the forefront of the districts who have been able to do that. Uh, my understanding from counterparts in other districts is that we have to work harder to get there, though. So let me tell you a little bit about what we've been doing. We've been trying to... Uh, See someone doing this here? Right, uh, right there, the clicker you need. It's right, no, it's right, Louise, it's right to the yeah. right. Sorry. That's okay. Okay, so. Oh, there we go. We've been working on making sure that we communicate the health and educational benefits of immunizations to students, families, and communities. And we're working to ensure that all students have to update updated immunizations. Um, what have we done differently this year? Um, so these are the requirements for this year, which is up here. 
Uh, they have changed somewhat from the past, but those are the immunization requirements for this year. Uh, the uh, addition this year has been to add the uh, varicella to the third grade and to add the Tdap and meningococcal to the 10th grade. Uh, everything else remains the same as it has in previous years. We are also working with uh, um, mental, um, the medical homes of students to make sure that they contact students and let them know that these immunizations are required. And we've asked, uh, we just got a, a very nice piece of information back from Kaiser that said that they will be sending out a letter to every one of their students' parents who are not up to date with their immunizations in the next week or two. Louise, if, you, if, I, if I might, I, um, th this is a helpful but complicated chart. And as when I was looking at it, I was trying to think back to when I went to school, which was a long time ago. And I remembered, I think, I got a vaccination when I was a little kid, but I don't remember having to do it again. I, how, yeah, I'm sure I did. I'm sure I did. But can you just, is this saying that you need, there's something that you need to get every year? Um, no, but there are things that are required and they look at what the different requirements are for the year. The big deal that happened about three years ago, which has been making our life much more complicated, is that the Department of Mental Health and Hygiene decided that our students really needed Tdap and meningococcal vaccines. And they introduced them because they uh, were finding that there were students who were becoming ill and that the original vaccines that they had had when they were babies and before they entered schools were not lasting that long. So, and then they've had a couple of real scares with meningo meningitis, which I think you've heard about, and they had this new vaccine, so they made this mandatory for students, and they made it a grade-related vaccine. It was one of the first times they did that, where this is, is something that you need to have when you're in seventh grade. So what happens is that when you leave school in June, you're in compliance, because you've met all the requirements up to, and the day you enter seventh grade, you're out of compliance. The additional piece to that that makes it more complicated is any student who's retained in the grade uh, becomes re required to have that vaccine the, the next year. So they did seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade, now it is up to 10th grade. And the meningococcal and Tdap are required for students all the way up through 10th grade. Which means, for example, for this year, last year we had any student who'd been retained in ninth grade then had to get the vaccine. There were over a thousand students that were out of compliance the first day of school that it, we had not known about because we didn't know which students had been retained. This year, students who were in 10th grade last year did not need the vaccine. If they get retained in 10th grade, they will need the vaccine this year because it's a grade related requirement. So that is one of the complications they put in. Um, they have been trying to put an HPV as a required vaccination. Many of us feel that it's a good idea, but we don't want to make it required because we don't want to have to beat the doors to get people to do what they should do. So, thank you. And this does look complicated, but it, um, it's in all the doctor's offices and it's in all the schools and it's loaded to infinite campus, so you can go against it and make sure that you have everything that you need. So. We created a new position this year. We have an immunization associate in my office whose job all year is to focus on the out of compliance students and make sure that students come back into compliance. It's been especially important this year because many schools have had problems with immunization in infant campus and she has been, sorry, I am challenged. There we go. And so we've been doing that. We have all done a we've done some major efforts to make sure that all seventh grade vaccinations requirements were made. And during the last nine uh, months, the Tyke Immunization Clinic at the health department vaccinated 29% pre-K students than the previous year. Also, our school-based health centers were instrumental in vaccinating students, both the ones that were run by the Baltimore City Health Department and the ones that were run by Baltimore Medical Systems. Um, the Baltimore Health Department of Baltimore Loves Immunization School Students, Bliss Project, operated immunization clinics exclusively for city school students on Fridays. Um, and then during the school year, they did some work between Infinite and uh, Immunet Registry and Infinite Campus, which resulted in uh, identifying many students that we thought were out of compliance that really were not out of compliance and they found a number of students who we thought had been out of compliance and they re-entered them. 
Now, I think this is what you want to hear about. This is what the school year 2017-2018 exclusion process. And one of the things that's going to be more difficult for us this year is that school is starting later. So we have less time than we've ever had before to do that catch up. Um, the exclusion date, the 20th school day, will be September 25th. We're going to pass out exclusion letters to all the parents whose child, children are out of compliance the first day of school. And it will tell them that unless they have an appointment, uh, they won't be able to, to stay in school, but we'll give them temporary admission until September 25th. September 25th will be the exclusion date. Now, there are students who are excused, excused from immunizations if they have a medical exemption from a doctor, some of those things might be things like chemotherapy or an autoimmune disease, or if they have a religious exemption. Uh, for a religious exemption in the state of Maryland, you do not need a letter from a, a doctor, you, sorry, you do not need a letter from a priest or an imnon or anybody else. You just need to state on that 896 form that you have a, a religious exemption, that you are not going to get immunizations. Um, and that just needs to be documented. Um, one of the things that Infinite Campus does allow us to, the school do is to run reports on an ad hoc basis to tell you what will happen by a certain date if students will become out of compliance even if they're in compliance now. And we've been instructed to, they've been instructed to contact families. Now, in line with that exclusion letter, we have sent letters to, we have sent the names of the students who will fall into that point to all the schools. So all the schools know who they are and they have been requested to let parents know during the summer so that exclusion letter will not be a surprise. Uh, we started back in March with robocalls, letting parents know that, you know, now that your child is entering this grade, this is the things they will have to have. Um, we've been doing summer outreach and the immunization associate has been on the phone and in schools doing summer outreach. And we're going to be working with partners to provide free clinics and school buildings and at partner locations. Louise, can you change the slide? Oh, sorry. That's okay. Okay. Did it change? Yeah, it did. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm not looking at the slides because I can't see them. <laughs> You're fine. You're fine. Okay. And then we're looking at these, the third and tenth grade requirements because those are students where the parents are going to be surprised. You know, we'll be surprised. And in fact, at this point, I have no idea who those students will be who were retained because we don't have our final list. So we're going to get to work on that as soon as we, as soon as we get that. Do you feel like these, um, this, this strategy, this four, four points that you mentioned here, will address any, some of the reasons that you had last year for kids not getting vaccinated? Well, we ended up with about 39 kids last year total. Total. And of the 39 kids who weren't vaccinated, some of them were students who had not returned or had different kind of reasons where there were some tactical thing. I don't know. I know that these strategies will help us get to where we were last year. Okay. Because without a concerted effort, we end up the first, we, we will end up the first day of schools with several thousand kids out of compliance. So at the end of the day, but, only 39 students out of our entire population did Yes, but the didn't. challenge is that's 39 who weren't vaccinated, but it's, there was more than 39 who we weren't paid for, who didn't have their vaccinations in time to get the right. That's funding. my question. So that's the challenge and so that was more in the two to three hundred range I want to say uh, that was a two three hundred range for the September 30th count mm -hmm. however we do get paid for students who get those in during the month of October it's yeah. just that the schools don't get funding yeah so we um, oh. we have to have a date so we have to have a date of September 30th there's a date by which we um, uh, you know that school because we need schools get their documentation. Yeah. So that's the date by which they have to get them on their rolls and vaccinated in order to get paid. We, there is a little bit more time after that we continue to work, can continue to work to get them, uh, to get those students enrolled and the system will get paid. But is it 39 that we weren't paid for? Is larger than 39 still that we weren't paid for? Um, I don't know because the final number had, had vacillated so much because when they were doing campus, so I, I don't know what the final number was that we so didn't But the for. September 30th enrollment deadline is important because we want to make sure the students actually get paid for the schools that they're attending. I, and so that's why we work so hard to that number and um, and that's why we you know are always trying to come up with strategies to prevent that um, that kids from passing that deadline um, without you know without being on the school's rolls in a way that we can have the school paid for them um, one of the challenges this year is the late start of school gives us less time to, do, to get and students. the um, when the you say we do we can get the money in October but it comes to the system not to the schools it comes to the system right why so it comes to, so we, so there's a period of time when we have to, there's a deadline that we have with the state to get all the paperwork in. Right. We have to give the schools a little bit earlier deadline so that we can then, you know, right. 
do our processing of that information in order to get it ready for the state. If, if vaccinations still come in after that period of time, we can still get paid for them. But um, we have to have a date by which we um, can process the information as well as schools remember when that September 30th enrollment number means often puts and takes for schools. So we have to have a cutoff date. It's not just about immunizations, it's about what school those kids attend. And so sometimes they're transferring from one school to another. Um, so there has to be a point in time when you kind of stop all that movement in terms of what the enrollment count is for kids because staffing has to happen as a result of that. So HC has to make determinations if a school lost a significant amount of enrollment, they might have to move Got a teacher it. or if they gained a lot, they might have to hire a teacher. It can't be too late. So it's not just the immunizations. Why September 30th is a date that we use. There's a number of factors. Okay, thank you. The other thing about it is that we will be excluding children from school. We want them excluded as little as, little as possible. Mm -hmm. We don't. We, we we would prefer that no children are excluded, uh, and, and unfortunately, um, many of our parents only wake up to fact that they have to get their immunizations when they get that letter saying their student's going to be excluded, and they have a date where they're going to be excluded by. Um, and people have asked about me. Just put immunizations are free. If you have, um, if you're part of an HMO or, or you have a medical assistance card, wherever you normally get any of your medical services, your immunizations are free. Immunizations at the health department are free. Immunizations from any of our team people that we try to get in are free. There is no cost for getting immunizations. So, Good Louise, uh, one additional strategy to consider, it certainly isn't all of our students, but uh, for our students that participate in athletics, they need a physical. So if it could simply go on their form for their physical or ensure it's there, are you up to date with your immunizations? Um, and especially entering into middle school may be the first time they've been required to do that, which lines up really well with that seventh grade need. Actually, uh, we have contacted all of the HMOs and told them that when they're doing the, the, the physicals for the students for athletics, because it's usually done at their HMOs, to check on their vaccination status. Uh, but putting it on the form would be a very good idea. That so we can certainly do that. It is a good idea. And we did a lot of outreach and support efforts this year. Um, uh, before June, the principals and the immunization coordinators in the building were informed both about current non-compliant students and about the students who will be non-compliant when entering next fall. We've asked the principals and supervisors to contact parents over the summer break regarding immunizations. We have actually provided each school with a list identifying the students who are who are now or will not be non-compliant, so staff will continue to uh, contact families. And the Maryland Partnership for Prevention will provide free immunizations at summer school sites with 20 more students who have signed permission slips. Um, I have to tell you that personally, and uh, Dr. Well, Alice is going to, I was very excited about the fact that people were going to do this. And we tried very hard at several different sites during the winter. We only managed to get one site done that way where they brought in the 20 permission slips. Uh, when you get volunteer organizations to come in, uh, they will volunteer to provide the immunizations, and they have a break-even point where the cutoff is. They have to have 20 students with slips, or else they end up paying money for a nurse and everything like that and losing money because the vaccine is very expensive. And they won't come in and just, and then one of the reasons the health department no longer is, is going to use a mobile van is that when you stock vaccine, it's got a limited shelf life. And what was happening was that they were coming to places and seeing two or three kids. Uh, the big hang-up is that you may not immunize any kid without parent permission. So either the parent needs to be with them or they need to have signed a permission slip ahead of time. And that is a really challenging aspect. Now, there is going to be um, a back to school immunization clinic on Saturday, August 29th at the Eastern Health District, where they will do a thousand of the kids who have figured out, not a thousand, a hundred of the kids that were not vaccinated so far. Uh, they're going to have, there's a tight clinic schedule which is posted on our immunization website for July. And since this was done, we have added the August schedule. And they are going to be offering immunizations at the mayor's back to school rally on Saturday, August 5th at the War Memorial Plaza for people who have not had them. Um, I had this idea, but nobody, my idea was rejected. So I will tell you what my idea is and then you can laugh. I said the mayor is giving out backpacks, and last year they gave out 1,300 backpacks and immunized 300 kids. I think they should get their immunizations first, but I was told that was too much coercion. Mm -hmm. 
I don't think it's okay. a bad idea. But what? <laughs> keep going. <laughs> I, I, you know, hey, I think we have to c come up with as many ideas as possible. Okay. And then our challenges are interesting. Um, the major, one of our challenges, the timing of the student retention in the summer school. So the, that list of students who are non-compliant is something we don't know yet. Uh, permission slip return is our biggest, biggest problem. Uh, documentation for legal exemptions. If you are doing, if you're getting chemotherapy or you have a medical condition that says you can't get immunization, uh, you have to have the doctor sign that 896 form. If you have a religious exemption, all you have to do is say you have a religious exemption and sign the form and then make sure that the school enters it into the uh, infinite campus. And then the other thing that's a challenge for us and it's been an increasing challenge as we are getting more immigrant students is that immigrants are vaccinated at their point of departure. Uh, nobody enters this country without having been immunized, but there's a catch-up schedule. And then we have to be contacting the parents saying, well, you can get this vaccine again on October 5th. You can't get it before October 5th, but on October 5th is when you're due to get the vaccine. So that catch-up schedule has been a challenge for some of our students. And go back here to Thank you. Thank questions. you very much. I think we asked, asked our questions during the presentation. It, it just was helpful to know what our strategy is and how thorough it is. So look forward to hearing that we at least reach our 99.5% rate again. Thanks, Louise. Thank you. All right, procurement. Um, let's see. Since there is a lot on here, um, I was going to propose that we um, only rate, only discuss the ones where we have questions. Perfect. To the fund for educational excellence is the first one. That was my first one too. Is that okay with you, Jeff, to only discuss the ones we have questions? Andy, is that good? Yes, absolutely. That's fine. So let's good go morning. to the uh, let's go to the fund for educational excellence. You go first. Sure. So my first and foundational question is a just to state that we're doing this for the record so that people know, but the other piece is we're contracting with someone to contract with someone else. Um, can you just explain that rationale, what, why we're not contracting directly with um, the organization? So in, uh, in this case, so the, um, the work that uh, Educational Resource Strategies did both for last year for the, you know, they did the work analyzing the size of the gap and predicting the magnitude of the gap and the drivers of the gap. And then going forward, they're doing work with us on um, the fair student funding, looking at fair student funding and, um, and you know, that we're, we're um, uh, about 10 years into fair student funding, so they're looking into uh, how it's working, how it distributes resources, whether the distribution makes sense in terms of meeting student need and is equitable. Um, and so they'll be leading that work. They will also helping, they're also helping us doing some allocation, uh, reallocation of resources to implement the blueprint that we've come up with to figure out how, should, based on all the work they did last year, where they, you know, really look deeply at our resource allocation is then how would we reallocate it to support the blueprint. Um, the bulk of this, this has been a large project that between the two pieces of the work, it's a large project, it costs a lot more than we are contributing to it. And so the role the fund plays is the fund is um, kind of convening resources. So they've early on, um, we have had several um, meetings with the philanthropic community where we've talked about this project um, and the fund then has been um, leading the effort to fundraise. So uh, we, as in order to ensure that, to help uh, uh, the fund with the fundraising effort from the philanthropic community, we committed to pay a certain portion of it. And so the part that you see here is our portion of it, but then that's only a tiny portion of it. So the fund is then going to um, collect the resources from the other um, contributions from the philanthropic community, and then they're paying the invoices to the to ERS as those resources come in. That makes perfect sense. And so a public thank you then to the fund and to Roger Schumann for his leadership on understanding this is important work as we move forward. That's right. So my question, um, was uh, related to equity, and there's a couple things that have come up over, well, I've been on the board four years, so over the four years. One was um, related to arts, 
and I just re remember my an early kind of realization that I had that a student's ability to get a high quality arts experience really was dependent this is how I came to understand it really was dependent on the ability of a principal to budget appropriately or to get different partners and that felt like you couldn't simultaneously say as a school district we cared about kids getting access to arts and let that happen and I, so arts was one thing that just has always sort of struck and stuck in my craw of yeah we were meeting some state mandate about a half an FTE or whatever the minimal but it's it's inequitable mm -hmm. and the other thing um, and then we saw a presentation from um, arts every day a couple of or the arts coalition a couple of board meetings ago or earlier this year just showing the trend line of arts teachers since fair student funding mm -hmm. and while you can quibble with the data you can't quibble with all the data it's down the second one was a, a question Commissioner Bondima asked uh, here um, a couple of ops committee meetings ago there was a central purchase of a lot of computers it makes sense to purchase computers centrally and then when we ask about who's paying they really are paid for by the schools and the same question came up we understood how fair student funding worked and the, the computers were being purchased by schools who had budgeted for computers but she still asked for and we all thought it was a very good idea that we should take a look at an inventory and see after all these years who's kept up who's got the computer so it felt like the same kind of thing to me are we deciding centrally that we want the schools to be up to date on technology are we deciding centrally that we want kids have equitable access to arts so those are the like the two big things that have really stuck with me and I'm wondering mm -hmm. in this review I'm sorry for the long intro but I've been waiting for us to do this review in, in this review are we going to are they going to be able to look at that kind of stuff because that strikes me as one of the one of the unintended consequences mm -hmm. of school-based decision-making so I think I would um, I, I first of all I think I would give caution to um, to uh, say that what the what you're describing and the work that the arts every day um, the analysis that they did is it indicative of what was happening with fair student funding because I don't think it is necessarily you have to remember just that the it tied they just right. showed the timing but that timeline is the same timeline during which the um, funding from the state uh, uh, became flat and so our resources have become tighter so whether we were allocating up the school level or whether we were allocating them more centrally our resources were going up for a period of time when um, from 2003 4 with the beginning of Thornton up till 2007 or so and then they flattened out and so that kind of is around the same time the fair student funding came in and so I don't think that you can necessarily as um, you know say that that is because of fair student funding it's also because resources tightened fair and so enough. we would have had to make difficult difficult choices if we were making all the decisions too fair enough but some schools are still knocking so it out of the park I think right and so I think um, on both computers and arts right and so I think um, I, I think you're getting in I think what you're talking you're asking about is questions with regards to implementation of how what is the guidance that schools have in order to make sure that they're making decisions that make sense um, and there's always a tension there between you know what is the right level of um, guidance to on the one hand um, provide some autonomy at the school level to make decisions about what they think makes most sense for the school community but at the same time there are certain priorities that we hold dear um, so some of that you see in the development of the blueprint the blueprint provides um, is going to be providing as we've discussed in some of the three by three briefings more specific guidance than there has been to schools about how they utilize their resources and how they staff their schools um, I um, I think um, the ERS work will look at equity from a perspective of the amount of resources that are going to schools I don't it's not currently planned to necessarily look at what the schools are spending their resources on um, I think it's going to be more about how do you distribute resources in a way that achieves that you know based looking at zip codes looking at um, where student you know um, student need and um, and whether resources are being distributed in a way that reflects um, the need of students I don't right now I don't think it's designed to be looking at things like are they spending it on an art teacher or how much are they keeping up their their computers up to date we can talk about adding that um, whether that's something they could do analysis on but that's not currently part of the plan I think that's more of an implementation of when you have a funding model how do you then provide guidance to decide what is most important and the challenge we are, are genuinely in is that we have much fewer resources than the state 
um, both in their um, review of the Thornton formula and their review of adequacy formula, says is, is reasonable to provide an adequate education to our students. So we are going to have to make difficult choices. I'm not trying to poo-poo those two priorities, but we have a lot of things our kids should have, and we don't have adequate resources no, I, to provide them. I, that's fair enough. I, I would say then for the when this comes to the board, mm -hmm. it would be I would it would be great if this write-up could be enhanced. Mm -hmm. What it says is. It says what the desired outcome of the project is, is a redesigned fair student funding formula that blah, 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 you know, adequate funding, adequate funding, student, you can't, it doesn't say what they're going to do. Like, what are they going to, what are they going to, what's, what's the lens? Like? Okay. What's the lens they're using? You know, what are we, because that's, I don't feel like this is an unreasonable question. That was a perfectly reasonable answer. So that helped me understand it. But uh, you just said it. They're not going to look at, how it's implemented. How they're spending the resources necessarily. They're going to look at what the availability of the resources are in different types of schools, different parts of the city. Just saying that okay. because that we can. You should be looking at us. I think we, I believe we wrote it, Matt. I'm looking at, yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. just mm -hmm. taking the note. I'm look, I am looking yeah. at you. Yeah. Um, but I think, because I think that's the, what the, I think the board, that's, mm -hmm. this is going to get pulled yeah. at mm -hmm. the board meeting because we should have that conversation. Yeah. We've been promised, or it's been referenced, not promised. Uh, several years in a row now during the budget s cycle that we're going to take a look at fair student funding. So you, when you go out in school site visits and you talk to principals, some love it, some are lukewarm. I think it comes back to a lot of other things. If you get a really awesome principal, things tend to work out. Mm -hmm. People secure yeah. additional funds, they make partnerships, they, um, so I, I get that, but mm -hmm. I just want us to be really clear about what this is and what this isn't because okay. we've been waiting for it. Yeah. So that makes sense, and um, yeah, I think um, it is. Uh, it, we do intend it to be kind of a ten-year look back at what has worked well and what has not worked well with the fair student funding. Um, and but I don't think it's necessarily a wholesale. Should we get rid of fair student funding? It's more of how do we make it better? Um, I think you know there are challenges with it, but I, I think uh, you know our, our our feeling is that um, while it's not perfect, it is. Um, Funding students that way is one of the more effective ways to fund schools than um, than a staffing model. So I assume in their process that they will interview principals. Yes, yeah, so they'll be I'm focus hoping. groups. I, I, I'm with, really hoping, mm -hmm. and there's plenty of data on the way that money goes and yeah. this and that. But I, we have I'm, an advisory really team that, that um, is going to have principals on it, um, and they and they will also do some um, meetings with um, more with community folks to try to get input on this as we go. Probably teachers too. I yeah, teachers. Say. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so I I really appreciate that, and I appreciate the direction. One of the things to consider is I think one of the things this board will be looking for as a metric to measure the success of the new formula is what programming do student, do all students get. Mm -hmm. um, so another data piece that they may want to look at is simply the master schedule from all schools mm -hmm. to get sort of what what are kids getting now, mm -hmm. um, and while that is deeper down into the weeds, I think it will be one of, well, it's one of the things that we look at as far as equity to students across the board. It, it may be deeper down into the weeds, but it's come up a couple of times and over, in, I, don't, I can't even remember which meetings. One was when we discussed the Fund for Educational Excellence report, and the quote that I grabbed onto was, you know, if, you know, 10,000 more kids want, I don't know, 500 more kids want what they're getting at Poly, then we should make there be something with more high high grade high quality technical education another one was about um, um, the comment I mean I've made the comment a number of times about the waiting list and the 21st century school design that was the other place where um, they were letting school-based communities as part of their engagement decide on the focus of the school which is lovely from a community engagement standpoint, and I'm all about that. But there may be some central needs that we have um, that we're seeing either through waiting lists or demand. But the equity argument mm -hmm. is, is you know, there's a balance. There's a balance there between what you what the community wants at that school and what the system needs. Mm -hmm. so, so, Allison, did, did you say there's going to be a work group that's going to over? Uh, I think we're calling it an advisory group that's um, made up of internal folks as, um, from the central office as well as some principals. And this is um, not something I'm pushing or suggesting. How, how would the board be involved in this so that it isn't at the end of the day you present mm -hmm. to us a finished product, but that mm -hmm. the board can be part of an iterative back and forth? Because mm -hmm. this is one of the more consequential things that yep. you guys will do. 
how is the board involved in the process? Yeah, so we'll, we will probably do a kind of the same similar approach we've had to the project, the previous project they did where we'll do board briefings along the way to mm -hmm. check in. So, um, you know, the three by three briefings probably make sense mm -hmm. um, to update you at the beginning, kind of middle and end as we do the work. Okay, this this we care a lot about this, yeah. a, a lot. I know about we, this. we this is really important, and I um, I'm excited for it. We've been well overdue for a long time. We've needed to do this, and every time we talk about it, it's okay. like wrong time in the year to do it to affect the next year's budget. So this is a this tight is the timeline. Right yeah, this but, is the right time. Yeah, but even this timeline is very tight. Um, so we're trying to move as quickly as we can, um, but um, it, it's important. And so yeah, you know, I would just just what you said. I think the briefings make sense. I. Um, I mean, for board members that have been on the board for a long time, maybe even pre-fair student funding, um, it might be worthwhile thinking of more than just sort of a presentation along the way that maybe certain board members are actually interviewed at the same way principals are. So at least you're mm -hmm. getting individual board member mm -hmm. sure. input on yeah. where you are. At least in the beginning of the process, you'll hear from board members who've had the experience I, for example, have had none, so I couldn't provide any value to this, but others yeah. may and should be, I think, interviewed as part of the process. Makes sense. Thank I'm going to say the same. If you interview me, I'm going to say those same two sentences, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. arts and computers, but, but yeah. I think it's a good I, I think it's well, I don't. I don't mean necessarily specifics on what programs should be focused on, just the whole notion of repeal and replace <laughs> to yeah. use a current. Like, if we're going to repeal Fair Student Funding, we're going to fix it. Or I mean, the whole, just the principle of it is so important versus central versus something in between. It seems to me that board members that have had experiences in this should be part of the process early on. Yeah, and again, I don't think this is, this is not, we're not viewing this as a repeal of Fair Student Funding right. at all. We're viewing this as how do we refine it to make it better, to improve upon right. it. It may be worth given that question, because I know it wasn't until two or three years in that I saw it. When this was first put into place, in Dr. Alonzo's administration, there was a, 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 a lot of background material. It it's, it's didn't spring from whole cloth. It would be worth sharing the under the kind of philosophical and research underpinnings for fair student funding. I don't know where those documents are, but I, I know we eventually saw them. We, we don't have to talk about that now, but it would be worth Given what you just said about it, we're you know we're we're, we're we're looking at it and making adjustments. We're not trying to repeal it, so people should really understand where it came from and what it's about. All right. So next up in the order here, um, Commissioner Hassan has a question on that. If I'm saying it right, Navman Wireless North America LLC. Is that how you yeah, say the it? automatic vehicle location procurement? So. First off, in, in follow-up to the customer service conversation, I think this is a great customer service piece, especially families who need to leave for work before their children get on the buses or in climate weather, being able to track, things like that. Um, but my question is, are we really putting these devices onto contracted vehicles? And if so, why aren't we saying to the bus companies or the people we're contracting with that this is a condition of us partnering with you or us using your service or buying this from you? if that's enough background information to the question. So some of the contractors already have... Can you identify yourself for the record, please? Yes, my name is Jacinta Hughes, the Interim Director of Transportation. Um, so some of our contractors already have GPS technology, but we don't have access to it. And so when we research it, it's better if we have the capabilities of monitoring the systems ourselves. So that's why we decided the lease option to put it on the contractor's bus and make it mandatory that they do use it every day so that we can get the data that we need to monitor the buses. And will that include our contract partnership with MTA? So will we be putting additional locators on MTA buses? No, it's only for our yellow bus fleet. Okay. That works for me. Very good question. Thank you. Great. Um, the next one for me is... Bear with me. I'm trying to get them in order here. Um, well, there, there, there is a transportation one, and so I'll go to that one first. Um, the education and logistics. Mm -hmm. yes. then, I'll then I'll come back to the Team Services Corporation. Um, I went back and found that the uh, you guys made an excellent 
presentation in March of this year about a routing study. And if I recall, one of the big punchlines was going to be changing the bell schedule. There was something that we could do to be more, I mean, that was one of the findings or one of the recommendations. Anyway, so I was just curious if, um, here we go. No, that's electric, I'm trying to get the right, education logistics. So this is a, we're going to piggyback a contract to provide routing software for school bus, buses transporting. Is there any relationship between that presentation and what we learned and what the recommendations were and the things that we were going to do to improve the efficiency of our routing and this contract? Yes, yeah, so in the routing study that we presented in March, they also evaluated the software that we used to route our students and Edgelog was deemed as a acceptable software. In addition, the GPS system that we just talked about, NavMan, will directly uh, interface with the system so that we can provide efficient um, operations as well. So this decision was influenced by that study? Yes. Okay. Just trying to yes. keep a thread through the different presentations. Yes. John Land, Executive Director of Operations. Um, the, the Edulog system we've had for probably the past five years, and that system was evaluated uh, by the uh, First by first student, the routing consultants. So it's, it's not a new system. It'll have some enhancements. Okay, great. Yes. Sorry. Um, are you finished with this? I'm finished, just finished with this item. I've got one more item. So I just, I'm sitting here wrestling with with the vehicle location thing again, and I just, I think we should push harder if for to eliminate redundancies. If they've got the information, and we're paying them a lot of money to use their equipment materials that well it's I, I understand it and I heard your answer that we want direct access but we sh they should just give us access to what's already on their buses um, so that we're not providing redundancy in that it just seems it seems that could be a cost savings and that we should whether it's this specific contract or contracts in the future we need to really push vendors that are making a lot of money off of, off of kids and our partnerships really push them to be all in as much as they can. So. The last one uh, for me was, um, is, there's two items for Team Services Corporation. This one is the Emergency Generators Repair and Maintenance. I I get. I would. Don't, I don't have to stretch my brain to understand why we would need a contract for emergency generator repair and maintenance. What struck me is um, Team Services old hourly rate is sixty-five dollars an hour, and the new hourly rate is eighty-five dollars an hour. My math tells me that that's a twenty-three percent increase. Um, the second contract that they're presenting to us for. Um, pumps and electric motors, on the other hand, has a 70 was the old rate, 70 was a new rate, which, okay, maybe there's just like an increased demand for generator repair. But under the evidence of effectiveness, it says Team Services is Corporation is the current provider of emergency generator repair, and, to con and they'll continue to provide it. Well, why, why would we, are we, why is it such a big increase, and if they're going to, is there another competitor that we could look to to, to do this work? That's a 23% increase to repair generators. It struck me, might be time to get another bid. Well, we, this is a five-year contract. There's, you need to um, identify yourself. Oh, Blaine Lipsky, Facility Operations, Director of Maintenance and Operations. A uh, few things. One is a five-year contract. Second, we're getting more. Um, we're getting newer technology, new generators with our 21st century schools, and we're relying on some of the older generators that we have in our existing schools with parts and stuff. We've actually sent this out twice on public solicitation. Okay. One primary because the um, we wanted to mirror what the state, I mean the city had as far as our requirements for MBE, WBE, the former, uh, so we're in line with them, and we still put it out on the street twice, and we only got one solicitation back. Um, so, we so put this it out. Is the com this, this is, is the a competitive bid. We're not okay. piggybacking off of anyone. We put it out on the street for approximately 
total of eight weeks in two different situations and you got one bid. And you know, it's, <clears throat> I, um, if I had read this more closely, it, there it is about the bid. I, I missed that. Um, that's very helpful. I don't have any other questions. Uh, I think what's happening is also is that you're getting more of a refined technician to come through the generators. Uh, not to say that a regular technician can't, but this is a five-year insurance uh, wages and everything over five years. We don't have a price incremental request in our contract, so it's a fixed price for five years. So. Yeah. I mean, it's just interesting. Um, but I'll give, come back with you if you have other questions. I'll no, find I, out why. What it's making me, what it's making sure. me think is that in our uh, CTE certifications, we should be helping kids to become certified to do emergency generator repairs because this is this is a good business. And if there's only one other bid coming through, um, matter of fact, it never occurred to me until just now that um, is there a relation what, to even inquire if there's any kind of a relationship between what you see, Blaine, and the work that you're doing, and the contractors that you work with, and the CTE, uh, Michael Thomas and. Uh, you know, everybody in that shop, you know, how one could drive, you can imagine a couple things. Uh, one could drive the other. There could be some trends that we could say, boy, we keep putting this out for bid. There, we're only getting one bid back, which puts it this, um, put, I'm not saying anything good or bad about this company. I don't know, I don't know them, but um, if we're only, if there's such a dearth of bids, then we are, you are going to be at the mercy of pricing. And it would, it could drive you to say, boy, is this a training opportunity for some of our kids? And you could also, um, I'm, I'm wondering if we ever do this, and I'm going to raise it, and then maybe we can talk about it at a future time. These contracts, um, we need them, and they're for a lot of money. And I'm wondering what we do now. Um, do we attach any kind of an, an education component to them? So Team <coughs> Services Corporation. Do we ask them to provide internships? Right? I'm just, I, I, I want to raise it and, and I, as, a, as a kind of a, it's almost like earlier, if they've got the GPS, maybe we could get access to it. Or if we're going to get some savings, could we leverage some of the money? If we looked across every procurement, particularly in the operations department, but not exclusively, the book sellers, the curriculum developers, the Fund for Educational Excellence. If everybody that gets a contract was asked, um, if we started attaching, we'd like to talk about internship opportunities for our kids. And So in the RFP itself, you're absolutely. saying indicating that that would be part Start of it? Start making it be known that, um, that, you know, we're thrilled to have these contracts so that you can fix our, gener fix our roofs, fix our plumbing, solve our lead pipe water problem. I mean, it's, it's an endless... All the technology stuff, the, the implementation of all these, you know, whoever's selling us all this new technology, um, somehow link it. Again, I want to flag this, and then I, I would like to, I don't mm -hmm. know what, what forum. It's, it's not a procurement discussion. But I would like to see us up our game on what we request from people. Um, it occurred to me now because he's trying to get the lowest price available, and there just aren't that many competitors. Well, maybe we could try to get something from them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just a thought. All right. It's, all it's a thought that's not going to go away, I promise you that. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a, I mean, it makes sense um, as a, something we could put in, in RFPs. I mean, it could have some impact on cost, too, but... Um, hey, what's the cost of the... Mm -hmm. the there's an increased emphasis on, on uh, CTE, those mm -hmm. certifications. Right. I'm thinking of the mm -hmm. NAF kids. I, we, we, people pushed and pushed and pushed on the 21st century and wanting there not just to be the, the jobs component, which has been pr doing pretty well, but then uh, Marnell, uh, Chair yep. Cooper, mm -hmm. asked over and over and over again about what are we getting mm -hmm. for our, our kids. And at some point, there was a really creative partnership developed. Mm -hmm. I can't re remember the name of the organization off mm -hmm. the top of my head, mm -hmm. but sure enough, you go to one of those work sites, and there's city school kids yeah. on site. Well, that they, makes don't, sense. they mm -hmm. don't come unless somebody says, we, Provide we, them opportunities. we want this. We are an educational mm -hmm. institution. We're not just about fixing the roof. Is there some kid who's going to learn something about fixing a roof as a result of us giving you this contract, or the plumbing, or the lead, or whatever? That's it. That was a Martha type question. I finally got one. 
All right. Sorry we went a little bit over time. Thanks a lot um, for all your great work. The transportation lady, she's smiling back there because she's like, I nailed every question they asked me. <laughs> All right, we're good. See everybody on, oh, we're not good? No. Uh, the next meeting is on August. I was August. just going to oh, say okay. that. The next meeting is on August 15th Sorry. in this room. Thanks a lot, everybody. Well, and thanks, Louise, thanks, Louise, for pulling that together. She's not paying attention, but that was really helpful to have the. I agree. Now, can I have a little gift for you? I don't really have a Oh, look at that.